Uh, welcome to the information session for the Master of Digital Product Management. Uh, my name is Catherine Broman. I'm the director of the program, and I will introduce um, my co-presenter, Beth, uh, here in a second. But thank you so much for uh, joining today. The webinar runs, the formal uh, sort of agenda runs for about 25 or 30 minutes, and then we open up for a Q&A um, at the end. And so we'll run through sort of a standard deck of, a deck of slides. So keep your uh, questions to the end. But in the um, meantime, Beth's going to watch the Q&A in the background. So you can put your questions in. Just recognize we won't uh, address them until we're through the formal part of the program. Okay. So just before we get started, it's important we acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories. We are grateful to um, be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. The agenda for the formal part of today is really, I wanna define the program and the opportunity. Uh, really specifically, I wanna talk about the unique element of this Master of Management program around the idea that we are actually in partnership with the School of Computing. So I'll talk about that. Then I'll give an overview of the program, a bit around the student experience, and then Beth's going to come on and tell you about next steps with regard to if you're interested, how you get uh, more information, and then we will move on to the Q&A. So these are the presenters, as I mentioned, I'm uh, Catherine Broman. So I'm an associate professor and distinguished faculty fellow here in digital technology. My background is actually in tech. So I started in uh, my younger career, uh, really in the technology space. Um, and so it's really been my pleasure to sort of build this program. I've been at Queens now for 21 years and um, I built a similar program in the University of Georgia that's still up and running. And so it's exciting to bring this um, bring this to Queens and to Canada and um, bring this to today to tell you about what it's all about. And then in a moment here, I'm just gonna ask Beth to come off mute and introduce herself, but she's our application advisor and actually the first person that you'll meet um, if you're interested in this program. So Beth, over to you just to say a quick hello. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, as Catherine noted, I'm the application advisor for the program. Um, so if you are interested in submitting an application or are inquiring about whether you may be eligible for the program, um, you can reach out to me directly and I can guide you through that process. All right, so thank you, Beth. And um, so we wanna just get kicked off with the idea of this digital product concept. And um, you know, digital products are an interesting it really depends on how you look at them. So a number of them are here. So whether we're talking about a smart watch or like an Amazon Echo, these are kind of products that are physical that we see popping up and helping us navigate our everyday lives. You might think about digital products as more software products. So like Salesforce is a great example of that, which is just a huge platform of different services that we can use to run our business. But that would be an example of a digital product would be the Salesforce suite and and all that goes with that. And then we have this idea that we have digital elements being added to physical products like this smart tractor. So we're taking like a, you know, existing uh, products and we're embedding these digital capabilities to make them smarter or to, you know, maintain them better. But everywhere you look, it seems things are being digitalized. And, um, and that really is what the program's all about, is as we move into the digital age, how do we digitalize these things, whether it be, again, a product or a business process, but how do we connect ourselves with the capabilities of digital technologies, more data, leverage social media better, and that really is what the program is all about. So what's the opportunity really depends on you. Um, you might be interested in, like, you really want to, you know, invent this next mind-blowing product, right? So you're just like, I, I, I want to revolutionize the way people manage their fitness, or I want to revolutionize the way that people meet other people. But what you, that could be you. You could be like, I, I'm, I have this burning desire to do this, and I have a great passion for, but I just don't know how to go about it. Another opportunity is what we call disrupting traditional industries. So perhaps you worked in an industry or you're working currently in an industry and you're like, wow, this industry feels like it needs a refresh. 
And so we go back to the old days of, you know, sort of when we just had taxis to bring us here and there to kind of what Uber has done to that industry. And when you look at that, that could be you, could be like, I'm sitting in this, you know, maybe even have 15, 20 years experience in an industry. And so you're like, I really want to help my organization sort of shift into some of these digital realities. And um, that could be why you're interested. And finally, the last one is um, you could sit like on the customer experience side of your business where you're really trying to think about how your organization really delivers value to customers. So it's more strategic, right? Where you're like, you know, there was a time when I could just kind of use my business analysis knowledge to be able to really understand how to bring value to our customers. But now, because our customers are all living in the digital age, you need just a little bit more technology muscle to do that. Alternatively, you could be sitting in more of the support functions in an organization. So you could be sitting in within HR or with legal, and you're starting to think, wow, this, the way that we onboard employees is changing, the way that we handle you know, professional development is changing. And maybe that's you where you're just like, I need to get better connected to how we kind of do all these internal business processes more effectively. So just a quick note before we move on, it's important to recognize that this information session, we're talking about people interested in coming into the program in September of 2023, because we actually are, we've actually launched the first um, intake of this program last week. And so what was really cool about this intake that we just sort of are welcoming now is the range of experience. So first of all, there's ranging across these different opportunities, but also the range in experience. Some people are two to three years out of university and they're kind of looking at this opportunity around, you know, trying to take their business analysis or their technical understanding that they got in their undergrad and really push it to the next level. But some people have 20, 22 years of experience. And so they've come in to say, huh, I've been doing this for a long time, but the world sure has changed. And um, I need to sort of update my skill set and the way I think about these things. So it really depends. And uh, definitely Beth can help you when, if you reached out to her, she knows all the stuff. She can kind of walk you through these different opportunities. So a great question, what is digital product management? So you think we have, this is the master of digital product management. So what is it? And it really is a role and a function. And let me sort of talk about those each individually. So it definitely is a role. So you might see in your organizations already the influx of the digital product manager. And it's important to note that a product manager has been around for a long time. Product managers have been here for physical goods for decades. The digital product manager is somebody that actually can take the product management elements, which is like really understanding how to, you know, innovate a new product and market that new product and make sure like manage that product through its life cycle. But you add the digital piece to it means that you have to actually integrate with the technology management function. And so that role is really an integrated role of technology and business coming together. And so, um, and that's why it's also a function. It's like, it would be great if we could just defer all of this knowledge to these digital product managers and not care if I'm the vice president of operations or vice president of marketing. But the reality is it's a function, which means that it, it sits inside your organization as enabling these new capabilities. And so therefore, it's also kind of relevant to people who maybe don't want to be a digital product manager, but need to understand this function in order to do their job better. And so Jessica Creases here is the um, head of our advisory board, and she's a senior executive at Cineplex Digital Media. And she talks a little bit about here how the best product managers have to think strategically about the business as well as hold the technical credibility. And there's a great link to her. She talks about this right on the MDPM website. Um, you can listen to her talk more about what that role is, how it works within Cineplex Digital Media and herself, right? How she defines herself as having these um, sort of this integrated set of skills and competencies. So the challenge that where the program came to be was this real reality check. We sort of understood that we understood how to manage technology management. So we understood how to build these software 
you know, solutions. We understood that product management was sort of alive and well in many organizations. But the reality check is that, you know, really post COVID, a lot of organizations tried to move their capabilities into more of an online or a digital um, presence and they struggled. So 78% of investments now this says Accenture is saying are failing. And many times you think about, well, this is just like a, should be like an IT project maybe, or an initiative that we should know how to manage. But the reality is, is, is that it's, it, we're not doing very well at it. And so that suggests that there's a whole new set of competencies, a whole new set of ways to think about the connection between some of product management and technology management, and now really strategy as to how we're going to operate and strategically uh, manage our business. And so this is uh, Dr. Nick Graham. So he is the academic co-director within the School of Computing. So he's been working alongside our, our academic uh, program director here in the um, School of Business, Jake Brower and myself. And he's talking here a little bit about the whole idea that we have to have sort of technology leadership and what does that mean? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about this kind of how did we infuse technology into the program um, because that's an important element as well. So many are saying we are in the golden age of product management. And so there is a 29% year on year growth of digital product management or product management job openings. We're also seeing the rise of the digital product or the product officer, right, as new members of the C-suite. The average pay is on the going up as well as the, um, you know, for the sort of the product manager as well as the senior product manager. And so this is uh, Tolu um, Aragamate, and he is at, he was joined our advisory board as part of Sportsnet, and now he's down at Meta Facebook. But he's just talking about this whole idea here around really people who understand the market. So he came out of our full-time MBA program and is now a product manager um, at Meta. So this is the partnership. Um, the partnership really did come together. And, and so we've been working really hard in the background to not you know, say that as a partnership program means you take you know, courses from the School of Computing and you take courses from the School of Business. And then it's the student's job to kind of integrate those things together. We made a commitment um, very early in the program and even when we went to start the program that we would do that heavy lifting. So the faculties of the two schools have been working together now for almost two years to really integrate and bring together um, those business skills and competencies with the technology skills and competencies. And that's what you'll get. So if you look at the program, the one thing I will mention is you may be sort of startled by the fact that there's so many courses in it, but don't be startled because the way that we did it, we just sort of, we, we put them into these little half courses as a way to really think about sort of micro level learning. And then we work really hard to embed um, the integrated learning component through the integrated project. So just don't be alarmed. Um, it looks like a lot, but we've done our best to be able to streamline it uh, to make sure that we have a great student learning experience. So the program is 12 months and it really does focus on modernized product management practices. And why I focus on that is that many people say, how is this different than if I did a certificate in product management from the product school or the product faculty? And the reality is that, you know, what we add to this is a real master's level education around critical thinking and ways to bring together the sort of this connective tissue between technology and business. And if you've been in the industry a while, we've been talking about this forever. You know, we're really, this has been around for a long time, but we're still not very good at building people who are capable or building skills that are capable of um, bringing these two sort of competencies together. So the result we have is sort of an, um, an expertise that really goes around the good use of technology, the good use of data, as well as really great management skills and really human management skills to be able to interact with people lead teams, um, you know, deal with conflict, all those kind of issues that every digital product manager deals with. So the experience, I want to talk specifically about four things, and this is not the whole experience, but at least it gives you an idea of um, what is in there. And again, these are the areas where we're happy to answer questions that go beyond this. 
So the structure is 12 months. So it starts um, right after Labor Day. So we just kicked off the program last, last week, this past week. And it runs to um, the following Labor Day where we present big integrated projects to our clients right after Labor Day weekend. So it's 12 months, three streams, and I'll talk a little bit about those streams. The second thing that's important to note is that it is, we've developed the whole program in what's called a no code, low code environment, which means that there's no coding in the program. So you don't have to code to come into the program. It's not a requirement and we're not going to teach you how to code in the program. If you wanna learn how to code, there's great you know, partners that we have that can teach you how to code in these different languages. But it was our decision that you know, we spend so much time coding that we can't really get into the life cycle management elements of the program, which is really the heart of why the program's here. So in order for us to, for you to have a good learning experience and actually build a digital solution, we have to embed this sort of no code, low code development environment. And so we, we, we use a number of different platforms um, where you can actually build things without coding uh, knowledge. And so um, WordPress is a good example of that. And so we use those as a way um, to, to teach you these technical and business skills as opposed to focusing the program on coding. That being said, if you have coding coming in, it'll be a different experience for you because then you actually can, you can use those coding skills. It's just not a requirement. And it's not something, it's not a learning outcome of the program itself. It is learn and earn and learn, which means you do it while you work. So the program is delivered on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings, class times, and then Saturday mornings. And so what we do is we make a commitment to students that sort of two of those every week, you have two classes and then another session that we book in that you work with your team on deliverables. And so we try to embed, Queens has been doing this a long time. We have a number of other master's in management programs, um, but we really do thoughtfully think about, you know, the fact that bringing on a program like this into already busy lives where you're working, some of you have families, but we really work hard to make sure that we're managing um, the requirements of the program in a way that keep you um, um, sort of healthy and strong through that experience. And then lastly, I've mentioned a few times, it is a fused program, which means it's interdisciplinary, where we really bring together not only the School of Business and the School of Computing, but within the School of Business, we bring together kind of marketing and technology management and organizational behavior and strategy. And within the School of Computing, they're bringing in, you know, software engineering, human computer interaction, uh, software development, they have a number of things that they're kind of bringing together. So there's a lot going on in, in the background, which is makes this program super exciting. The program itself has a September start date, as I mentioned, one to two evenings per week plus Saturday mornings. It is remote. So the entire program is remote with the exception of a one week residential session here in Kingston. So it will be um, your responsibility to travel to Kingston and to participate in this kind of one week, I think it's actually 10 days, right, where we bring you to our executive development center. This is where we onboard the students, we get to know each other, we launch our teams, we sort of set the infrastructure down in a physical way, and then we you know, send you off back home so you can then navigate the rest of the program virtually. We've also put in a significant infrastructure around coaching and advising. So you will have a team coach that is trained on virtual team work that can really help you make sure that you're operating well in a virtual team. We also use um, industry advisors. So people from the industry, each team will be given an industry advisor to help them with their integrated project. Um, so we definitely do create a, a, a sort of an infrastructure, a support infrastructure to make sure we set you up for success. It is team-based learning. So this is actually, we've upped this a little bit. We're going now with sort of seven to eight person teams. The reason why that is because we, we have an idea of what these integrated projects are gonna look like. So our teams are going to be a little bit bigger. Um, you have a dedicated professional coach, as I mentioned earlier, and an industry advisor. The one thing that's really cool about Queen's Master of Management programs is we have um, real, significant focus on high performance team training. So really when you come in, you spend the first two days of residential session with our team coach, um, uh, high performance team coach instructors who really teach you how to be effective in a team environment. 
And then industry practices are used for team formation. So we do a number of things to make sure that, and we use a number of different tools to make sure that your team composition is put together in a way that makes you the most um, effective. So these are the program courses. This is the slide that you're like, whoa, one year and all these courses, but trust me, they're just like little learning sprints, the way that we've identified them. Um, and a number of the, in, the deliverables are integrated with other courses. So that's a big part of my job. And as well as um, Nick uh, Graham, who's our academic co-director and Jake Brower, who's the academic co-director within Smith. But the three of us work really hard together to make sure we design this from the student experience. So although you take all these courses and definitely we cover all these competencies, we integrate a number of the deliverables to make sure that we um, really make it so that you're not managing 17 times a whole bunch of deliverables and it's completely out of reach. But there's a knowledge stream and that basically lays the foundations of the program. And then we have what we call an application stream. This is really um, experiential learning. So a number of these faculty work in industry, they really understand industry, whereas the knowledge stream is more thought leading research um, that's going on in this space. And then there is a nine month practicum. So it kicks off in October and you and your team will run through the entire uh, life cycle of a digital product build um, from October all the way to the following August. And so that's the program. Here's just some of the faculty um, we have, again, from representation from both schools. We have representation from both industry, so adjunct faculty, as well as professors um, who do research in this space and actually are some of the most significant thought leaders in the world around this digital product management um, skill set. And then we have an industry network um, that includes both our advisory board. So we have an advisory board that are, I'll introduce you to them, a few of them in a second as well as the sort of network of other um, people who have really just come to us, a lot of them being alumni, excited about the fact that we have this new program in place and wanting to offer their insights. This is some of our advisory board members. And so you can see we've got representation in government, we've got effort representation in consulting, we've got the sort of the, um, the fangs represented here. So we have Facebook at the table. And then Jessica, as I mentioned earlier, is our chair coming from uh, Cineplex uh, Digital Media. The student experience, talk a little bit about the residential session. So the residential session here in Kingston, again, it's sort of a nine day um, all inclusive paid vacation to Kingston. So we, what we do is we, uh, you know, that being said, you, you just have to pay to get here. And then we, we take it from there. So we put you in at our executive development center you know, we sort of, we plan out both curriculum as well as social and team building events, but it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of fun to come into Kingston and, uh, and do that. The other thing we have, what we built out is what we call a virtual learning platform. And that virtual learning platform, I'll discuss kind of more details here in a second, but it really does assist the fact that we've gone the majority of the program being virtual. So we have to make sure that we're giving you that infrastructure. And then the experiential learning component, as I mentioned earlier, is the, um, is the integrated project. So this is Kingston. If you've never been to Kingston, it's, it's quite a lovely place, especially in September. You know, the only thing when I was doing this program is I was like, I don't want to bring you to Kingston in February. Um, you know, September is a much better time. And so, you know, you get an opportunity to see the city a little bit. We have the school here, of course, but we do spend um, sort of that 10 day uh, stretch here in Kingston. The other thing I'll mention is we do have a great, what we call a fit to lead team. And so they help you not only manage your week with regard to getting all your curriculum stuff done, but also making sure that you get out there and sort of we make um, the, the uh, experience a little bit more physical and fun. This is some detail on the virtual learning platform. And so really what it is, is it's you know highlighting our expertise in the virtual programming space. And so we've created this you know, studio style virtual learning platform where we'll use tools like Miro and Trello that are really industry leading tools. And we try to use those in a way to manage the program so that you can get working um, knowledge of those. And so teams ideally will experience you know, collaboration and hands-on activities, even though we're in a virtual environment. And it is an asynchronous learning environment. So many of the courses are taught in a way that we are like online, you know, physically communi communicating with each other, 
but we are slowly moving to kind of more self-study and more trying to independent learning. And so we're trying to make that learning experience as effective as possible. The experiential learning is the nine month practicum. And this is really where you, you know, the rubber hits the road. You can apply all the skills that we taught you to these uh, industry sponsors. And um, the, some of the really cool projects I really try to focus on, you know, companies, whether they be a not-for-profit or different, you know, different communities that really could use help um, in virtualizing or, or digitalizing their business processes. So, um, the, we choose our clients very carefully and um, we try to make sure that they're aligned to giving you the best experience as possible. We do have a career management framework. So because this is an earn to learn program, the assumption is as many, most students come in with a job, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you either want to stay in that job. So if you are like, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about doing this program because you want to pivot out, we have a, a great career management framework. And so they'll help you. They do a bunch of assessments and coaching to really understand and discover what your strengths are. And then they work out um, uh, a number of different opportunities for you to build your skills and your personal brand. And then they actually will help you recruit. Like if you're like, yeah, no, I want to, I want to move after this program. I want to go to a different, um, a different job. They can help you do that. On the flip side, though, what's really neat is that if you're like, no, I probably wouldn't use this resource. The one thing that's really neat about it is that a number of our current students are saying, I don't really plan on moving, but I'd be happy to be a coach because there's a whole bunch of different students within the Smith environment and the School of Computing that want to be their aspiring digital product managers. And so you could also get involved in this network to provide your coaching services, if that's something. But there's lots of opportunity here within our career management group. And so that's it for me. I think, I mean, I'm going to check in with Beth to make sure I didn't forget anything. But, um, I, but before I do that, I'm going to turn it to her. She's going to walk you through the steps um, of how, it, you know, kind of what you need to do if this has intrigued you and you want more information. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. So over to you, Beth. Thank you, Catherine. Um, if we want to flip over to the next slide there. Um, so really, if you're watching this and you're interested in submitting an application, the first thing that you have to do to get started is just send me your transcript and resume. Um, so really, it's that easy from the start. Um, that's called a preliminary assessment. So I'm able to read over those and see really if you meet the basic criteria um, to apply to the program. And so from there, I can give you feedback based on that. Or if you are eligible, we can move through the remainder of the application process. Really, my role is to guide you through that process um, and really make sure that you're building a strong case and a strong profile for your application. Um, we do work on a rolling admissions policy, so that means that we don't have any firm cutoff dates. Um, we will accept, accept applicants kind of as they come in, so we're, we're working through that way. Um, so with that being said, you do want to make sure your application does come in early in case the class does fill up as it did this year. We do have the fees listed on the screen there. Um, and as Catherine noted, um, within these fees are your, your travel, your accommodation costs, but not your travel costs for the residential sessions. Um, but beyond that, they do include your tuition fees, um, any learning materials, software licenses. Um, so that's all included up front. The only fee that you have to incur is your travel cost to get to Kingston for the residential session. Um, with those fees, they are broken up into three installment payments. Um, in addition to your deposit payment, that essentially secures your seat in the program. Um, so that is required um, upon your enrollment, really just to secure your seat in the program, tell us that you're coming, um, and then the remainder of their fees are broken up from there. We do have a number of financing and scholarship options. Um, so for the Dean's Entrance Scholarship, those will be assessed upon your admission to the program. Um, so you'll have to watch out for that. If you, you are accepted into the program, that's when those will those conversations will happen. Um, we do also have scholarships for Black and Indigenous students. Um, so if you become an enrolled student, you're eligible to apply to those. Similarly, with the Queen's um, Central Scholarships, once you're enrolled, you're eligible to formally apply for those as well. Um, something to note, though, with the financing considerations, um, with your personal income tax, ultimately, a percentage of your tuition fees are reimbursed through this process. Um, so that's something to be mindful of as you're kind of weighing the fees of the program. In addition, we do have a partnership with RBC. Um, so that's for a student line of credit. And we have some contacts that I can provide you with that if you are interested in applying for a line of credit. 
And kind of finally, we do have a case for sponsorship document. Um, so if you are interested in applying and you are currently working, we can provide you with it. It's basically a brochure outlining the program and kind of its benefits to your employer. Um, so that's a great resource if you're kind of looking to frame a conversation to ask for sponsorship with your employer. And that kind of concludes our presentation for today. Um, so hopefully you're, you're interested in applying from there and um, you can contact me directly or, or submit your online application at the website below. Great. Well, thank you, Beth. And I think I just looked quickly in the uh, Q&A here. So I think Beth's teed up a couple questions for me, which I'm happy to answer. It's, it's a great time now to, for you to put your questions into this Q&A um, list because then we'll kind of work through those. I did want to pick up though on uh, on the case for sponsorship, and um, because you know the benefit that we're having now is we actually have a cohort. So previously doing this, we didn't have students to work with, but now we have a cohort of students that has come in. And the case for sponsorship is a really cool idea, primarily because of the question around are digital product managers better to hire or to grow internally. So, you know, if you're a company or you work for a company and you're like, hey, this is a skill set that we're really trying to develop, there's two different ways you can get it. You can go recruit for it or you can build it in house. And the more experience I'm having in this space, the more I'm seeing the benefits of building it in house. And the reason is because when you have in house people, they know your business. And a key to digital product management is knowing the business model, knowing the company's business model and how the business model works. And so I'm finding more and more evidence that, you know, you can really kind of flip people um, fairly, you know, seamlessly into a digital product role, especially for people who've been a business analyst or somebody, and you can just kind of give them the digital product management set of competencies and they, they, they move and progress um, quite nicely. And so the case for sponsorship then becomes a discussion really between you and your employer to say, if I'm going to go out and do this program and it's going to cost me $39,000, um, will your company pay for some of it? And if they are going to pay for some of it, what's the parameters around that? Do they want you to stick around for a while? That kind of thing. But we are probably fielding more sponsorship calls now than we ever have with companies recognizing we're here and um, saying, hey, I, I wouldn't mind to enroll a few of my own employees into this just to build that competency in-house. So, so I'll leave that with you, but it is quite a, and Beth's got all the documentation, but it is, it is uh, quite a nice way to think about how to build this skill set internally. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead, Beth, and read off these, because I'm, I'm pretty sure the ones that she sent my way. So the first one was a question around, in progressing in a career in product, would it be better than, um, would this degree be better than an MBA? So, uh, and again, now I can speak intel more intelligently about this because we have a cohort. So um, a couple observations I've seen, um, there's people in the program that have an MBA. So they have an MBA, but they don't have, uh, like they don't understand product management. So they're coming back after having an MBA, more senior in their career, and they're getting a master of digital product management because they want to be able to become a leader in kind of the digitalization. So they could be in, like, let's say they're in finance and they're like, hey, I'm, I'm working as a head of finance, but now we're moving into like, you know, cryptocurrencies and a number of these different digital artifacts around, you know, digitalizing our customer experience. And I'm having to lead all these technical, um, you know, initiatives, and I don't really have the muscle to do it. So they're coming in to, to learn it that way. So I have seen that. And so that's kind of a, a neat um, way to think about it. The other thing I've seen is young students. So people that are coming in with two or three years of experience kind of saying, should I do this or should I do an MBA? And that really is a, a good question because um, it really depends on kind of what you want to get. So two arguments. One, you could say, I'm going to do an M like a master's of digital product and work in the digital product management space for four or five years and then go back and get an MBA. Um, other people might say, no, I'm going to do an MBA first and kind of get the general um, lay of the land with regard to, to business management and then maybe think about this as a sp specialized discipline later. But the big takeaway here is there's no finance in this program. There's no accounting in this program. So this isn't 
either or. It's not, do I do a master's of digital product or do an MBA? Because really an MBA is going to get you into those, this, like to be able to manage multiple silos. So if your desire is to go high up in the organization where you're sitting in a, an, e, in an EVP role or a VP role, um, you know, unless you're the EVP of digital product management, and even then, I would still say you're still going to need accounting and finance and a number of the other specialized business disciplines. Um, so it, it really does become a when you're going to do these degrees, but they're not interchangeable. The other thing I will mention is we do have um, a, a program in place where we can we can merge the two. So you can do an MBA with an MDPM option. And so Beth can walk you through those, but we have actually built that out. So what would it look like to do them both and uh, trying to really understand how to offer you that in a way that makes it also affordable. So we, we do have some, um, some frameworks that we're working um, on there to explore getting both at the same time. So I think I answered that one. And I think that the other one I have here, I don't know, Beth, if you can, here we go. Maybe I'll go down to this one, Raina's question. I'm a product manager with a background in business. Um, would we be covering some technical concepts in the program? I'd like to bridge the gap, definitely. So the School of Computing owns 45% of the content. So they own you know, all the stuff on prototyping, experimentation, wireframing, security, architecture integration, um, that's all their content. It's just recognizing, Raina, that it's in a no-code, low-code environment, which means you won't get any programming in this program. So if you, they'll teach you tech fluency, they'll teach you tech literacy, they'll teach you, some of the faculty might even teach you how to read code, which I think they probably will. Um, but the whole idea is like, you know, our experience and our research suggested that digital product managers aren't coding, so they have to be able to exactly, as you say here, cover the technical concepts so that you understand what your technical people are doing, but you're not actually doing it yourself. And that's their job. And uh, they are a huge part of this program with regard to the skill sets and learning outcomes. And so definitely we'll be covering the technical concepts um, in the program. Then there's a question here, as someone mid-career who did do their BA over 15 years ago, how much weight is on transcripts versus work experience during the application? I would say the um, weight definitely sits higher on the work experience, especially if you're sitting 15 years in. So my experience, again, I have five kids. Uh, <laughs> some of them have outstanding BA experience, like you know, undergrad experiences, some of them not so much. And uh, I'm kind of like, you know, we definitely do have an academic requirement that Beth can kind of walk you through. But if if sitting in front of an application and there's a need for a choice to be made around, you know, which one to weigh heavier with 15 years experience, certainly the weight on your performance in your undergrad um, definitely is, is diluted, you know, but it, there is an academic requirement in the program for sure, um, because it is, it isn't, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it covers a lot of ground. We, we, we learn quickly. So we want to make sure that we're, we're getting people into the program that can handle the academic requirement as well. I might just turn to Beth and just make sure, because I think this one, um, this next question is for you around how can we can, um, contact you about this dual option. Yeah. Um, so I'll definitely let you answer that and then loop back on anything that I might have um, that you want to add to any of my answers? Of course, yeah. Um, so I did just reply with my email address. Um, so that's open to everyone in this call today or anyone watching later. Um, you can email me directly at bethany.mccallum at queensu.ca. Um, so just like my name on the screen with a little dot in between at queensu.ca and that's the best way to contact me. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have with that. Um, we do have a question for you, Catherine, um, from Savannah. So that's just in the open question. Um, so she's wondering um, if she would still qualify for a program like this, being more in product marketing at a B2B software. Um, her education is more in arts and business. And she's wondering how important it is to have an education in tech or software for this program. Right. Well, and you're sure right, Beth. I just clicked on the open questions and I was like, oh, I was reading off of Beth's answered questions. So let me <laughs> let me hit all of these. Okay. So Savannah, as the first one here, 
Um, so the, the marketing uh, question is an interesting one. And I think it's because, again, now that we have data, there's probably six, maybe even seven students in the new program that are coming in with a digital marketing background. And so they already have the skill sets around like, you know, web optimization and the whole idea of how you do CEO stuff or SEO stuff. And they're, they're very well informed on the digital marketing side. And so what's been neat is now I've taken those six or seven and I've put one on each of the teams. So your expertise, Savannah, would be if you have an, ex an expertise, I'm going to leverage it. I'm going to be like, oh, that's perfect. Let me put one of these because digital marketing is a key element of digital product management. But in a similar vein, I also have six or seven students that have a user experience, a UX background. And so I've distributed them across the teams. And so, yes, definitely. If you have a deep level, a, de a deep skill, whether it be, you know, maybe it's data analytics, maybe it's, you know, user experience development, maybe it's marketing, maybe it's business analysis. What you'll do is you will build out the other pieces. So we have like a digital marketing course, we have a user experience design course. And so we will be introduced to all the other kind of skill sets around this digital product management competency. So definitely, um, if you have a deeper knowledge, um, because I would say there's not one area that we go real deep into, other than lifecycle management, right? So the whole course is built around sort of um, modernized project management, product management, how do I navigate something, a, a product from cradle to grave? And that management competence goes deep, but all these little kind of supplementary competencies, we, we introduce them to you, but we don't, we don't go deep into them. So maybe Beth, I'll let you point me to the next question here rather than, or just let me know, should I just read these down from this open question? Are you filtering them out for me? Exactly. Yeah. So I've been going through any that I can answer through the chat and kind of responding right away. Um, but any that I've indicated that we can answer live, if you could touch on that, that'd be awesome. Sure can. All right. So um, question here, what are some of the trends in terms of industry demand for these roles? What are these roles? What, where are these roles popping up and where do you, um, why did you start the program now in the fall of 2020? So let me just kind of break that down. So what are some of the trends in terms of industry demand for these roles? We're definitely seeing growth. So a bit of the idea, and you can go on the website here to take a look at these, what we call it a bit of a mushroom effect, right? And it goes back to why we started the program. It all started after COVID-19. So COVID-19 was a real um, uh, pivot point for us. Uh, we've been shopping and thinking about this program for quite some time. In fact, the first version of it's of it was 10 years ago where I started to see this sort of what I would call a project management kind of mentality shifting into this product management, uh, you know, competency. And so that's been going on for quite some time. But when you talk about where these roles are popping up, what's really cool is that they used to kind of just be in like tech firms. So if you want to be a product manager, you'd go to Silicon Valley, or you'd work with for one of the, you know, big tech companies. But when COVID happened, all organizations had to think about how to embed technology into their day-to-day -day processes. And so a lot of the language you'll hear is around this kind of quote unquote digital transformation concept, which is like, I've been in business for 60 years or my business is a hundred years old or whatever. And we're trying to now move into the digital age. And so now these roles are popping up everywhere. So we see them in banks, insurance companies, you know, we're seeing them in packaged goods, we're seeing them in media, entertain everywhere, you know, sports, everywhere. Everybody is trying to think, how do I digitalize and connect with my customers in a more um, in powerful way? But then the really interesting thing is we're starting to actually see them internal. So how, as me as an HR organization, how do I manage my employees in a way that are more, that's more digital and more data-driven? And so they're kind of turning up everywhere. The challenge is that they're called all different things. So, you know, something like a digital change agent or a digital designer or like they're, but you, you read them and they're not all called product managers because product managers are really kind of the, the people that are managing the, the product management lifecycle. That's why I made reference earlier to it being both a role and a function. 
because the functional elements, you might be called something different, like a digital change agent, but you're still a digital, you're still using all the digital product management competencies. So hopefully that answers that question. If not, let Beth know. The next question is um, from my point of view, how have the job opportunities for DPM changed over the past three few years? Which level entry mid senior do you feel most DPM hirings would be in the near future? Okay, so definitely companies need entry level talent. Um, and, but I've also seen a number of like undergraduate programs um, kind of trying to sort of pivot into this space. But I would say that's why I made the program two to three years out is because I really think digital product management requires you to have some business experience. It's really hard to be this role when you have none. But that being said, sort of like been in, in the industry for two or three years, did an MDPM, like the people that I have in the program now that are like two to three years out coming back to do this program, I expect will place very well working with our career advancement center coming out of the program. And they would be what I would consider entry level digital product managers, not entry level you know, grads, but entry level digital product managers would have kind of three or four years of experience with this degree in hand. They're in pretty good shape to, uh, and there's a lot of demand for those types of people. The mid-career people are interesting because I'm finding that they are really trying to move. Like, so like I have a number of people in the program that are like from an IT background. So they've been lived in IT. They have five or seven years of experience there and they want to move into more of a, a digital product role, right? Or they've sitting in another question, they've been sitting in digital marketing for five or seven years and they want to move more into a digital product role. So, and I'm also seeing a lot of demand for that. And what's nice about those people is they come with an existing skill set, one of the deeper silos of competencies. The, but the senior one is again, very interesting because the senior level organizations are all recognizing like or even around the C-suite, there's um, people talking about bringing on like a, a VP of digital product or actually putting them at a C-level, like a chief product officer. And these people, um, surprisingly, I mean, Beth can, but I feel like there's um, a third of our cohort for sure that have sort of 13 years of experience and more. Um, and these people are trying to do a senior shift. I'm not sure these people are recruiting though. Like, I think they're doing an internal move. They're kind of saying, I need this internally because I sit around and talk to my peers and we recognize I need to be more digital in the way I think, so, think about things. So they're coming back to do this program while they work and, uh, and uh, get the skill set in order to move forward in their current leadership position. So hopefully that answers that question. And then, um, what are the demographics in your first cohort? How large is the class? How did you match up the teams? So um, interesting enough, we had committed uh, to take an intake of 40. And um, because in any new program, there's always a lot of moving parts. And so uh, we tend to, to make a, a small inaugural class just so we can pivot and, and we, uh, and what was really neat is I, I said I'd take 40, I expected maybe I'd get 22 and we ended up with a wait list and actually everybody we accepted into the cohort um, we couldn't take because we have size limitations and committed to the faculty that we would keep it in and around 40. So our current cohort is 43 um, and um, and how we match the teams up is really in a couple things. So I started with um, experience. So I, I tried to distribute experience across uh, years of experience. Um, and then I went by role. So I tried to put each of the students into one of these roles, like a digital product marketer, a digital designer, you know, a UX designer, like I have all these roles to find. I tried to distribute them by competency. We have a, quite a nice diversity. So we use diversity to try and make our teams nice and diverse with regard to age and um, gender and nationality and, um, you know, we have everybody is, um, uh, we don't have many international students in this intake. Primarily, we're trying to 
run it um, within the Eastern Standard Time Zone because we have this virtual, but we have a number of students that come from different parts of the world, which is amazing. They're just in Canada. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to see that. So that's how we put the teams together. And then we use, um, we use a, a, a one assessment that we use in all the programs, which just makes sure that we understand the different personalities on the teams. And then we are trying out, actually, we're trying out business chemistry from Deloitte. Um, they have a nice tool around. So we're, we're piloting that to see whether or not um, business chemistry, like really building your team, um, using these different chemistry elements, the different roles will be helpful. So we're kind of, but team performance is a huge, huge, huge um, priority for us. And so that's how we've done that. All right. Uh, could a DPM pivot into, yes, I, I, can't even, I can't even answer this. So the question is, could a DPM pivot into a digital transformation role? Absolutely. Um, you know, when I talk to this first cohort, I, I am amazed at um, the level of experience. And I would say a number of them are going to be real key agents for, for digital transformation, like the, the key people in their organizations that are leading the transformational agenda. And, um, and so because we really get into the philosophical um, like what gets the master's program, we can get in kind of the philosophical uh, elements of managing that actually are creating headwinds for these transformational initiatives. And actually this question is interesting because the digital product management um, success uh, um, statistics are actually a little bit better than the digital transformation ones. They're awful, right? Like it's like 16%, 14% of these digital initiatives transformation initiatives are actually succeeding. So definitely the answer to that is, and then what advantage or limitation would an MDPM candidate have against a product manager or a brand manager with an MBA in a digital product company? Okay, so this is an interesting question. So I would say if you're a product manager in a digital product company, like let's say you currently work as a product manager for Google. Um, a number of these industry uh, accreditation programs are built out of the competencies that came out of, out of Silicon Valley, which is really, a lot of them are really grounded in kind of design thinking kind of um, frameworks. And one of the advantages is that for our program, because we have um, you know, research-based faculty and we really have a number of experts and thought leaders in the area of how modernized management techniques are changing, that's one advantage, right? We don't just give you the skills. We explain why those skills are so important and how to apply them in different contexts. We're not just, it's not a training program, right? Um, and, and so I think a lot of the, you know, not to say that some of the industry programs aren't doing this as well, but because we have leading academics with, you know, with have dedicated a good chunk of their life to getting a PhD and really understanding management concepts. And same on the School of Computing side. Like some of the faculty from the School of Computing have been doing, like Nick Graham has been building um, um, gamification systems for kids with uh, cerebral palsy his, his whole career, 30 years, right? So there's just some really deep knowledge, which I think would be an advantage of the um, MDPM program. A limitation of the program is that you're going to have to go out and leverage a number of these industry practices if you want to get deeper into something. So let's say you want to become like really good at wireframing. Like we're going to tell you what wireframing is. We're going to show you how to do it, but we're not going to teach you a six week, you know, LinkedIn learning course on wireframing. And so that's why I've always pitched this as these are complementary things, right? We work with the industry. Um, designations and the people in this space that are really helping the digital, you know, uh, skills gap from their perspective, we complement uh, complement that. What it, and so the last one here, and I think we're I love that the questions are still coming in so late in the game. So we're twelve fifty five, my time. So definitely we have this one, and if there's anybody else can flip in one more, we probably have time for that. So what is the difference between a product owner and a digital product manager? Another great question. So um, I would say um, when we talk about the digital product manager as a role, 
the product owner would be that role. So, um, you know, when you own, when you are a digital product owner, and again, it always depends on the type of company because, you know, digital product owners can have different skill sets depending on what companies they're coming from. But I think by definition, like when you own a product, a digital product, you make all the decisions about how that product's going to be marketed and what the technical elements are going to be. You are flexing the digital product management skill set. Absolutely, 100%. And so I wouldn't say that there is a difference in with regard to the role, but I think the function, I, my argument has always been many people need to understand digital product management for the digital product owner to really be effective and do their job. So the challenge that I've seen with digital product owners is that they have great accountability and authority over the product, but they don't have authority and accountability and really influence. It's hard with everybody else they need to work with. And so when you build out this competency across beyond the digital product owner, right? Um, it makes that product owner's job just so much easier. And it makes the transformational agenda much more successful. So I hope I answered that question, Daniela. Um, great question to end. So no more open questions, Beth says to me. Um, definitely. And I just I just pop um, Beth onto here. And then maybe Beth just pass it back to me and I'll kind of say a formal goodbye. Awesome. That sounds great. Um, thank you everyone for attending today and for anyone who's watching a little bit later. Um, it was great to have all of these, these great questions um, about the program and it's nice to see everyone um, so interested in the program and, and the new way that we're kind of taking the direction of things. So that's awesome. Great. Back to you, Catherine. Okay. Thanks, Beth. So the one thing I will mention is Beth mentioned that it is a rolling admission, um, but we do have a capacity on the second cohort. And so based on the success of the program this year and the fact that we've already had to create a wait list um, for the first cohort, the only thing I would suggest is that earlier, the better. Um, even though it's a rolling admission, um, you know, we are recruiting now for September 2023. But, you know, if this is something you want to do, I would encourage you to get in as early as you can, because we don't know. I know we're getting a lot of interest and um, we are still the first in the, pro like in the, in the country. And, um, and even in North, in North America, we are getting a lot of even people from the United States that are interested in what we're offering here. So I would say if you're interested, you know, sooner than later, get in touch with Beth, um, let her walk you through it. She'll also help you understand the differences between some of our other programs. If you're like, mm, I'm not sure this is the right thing. I'm also interested in data analytics. What's the difference between this program and maybe our Master's of Management and Analytics, Beth can answer all of those questions. So on behalf of Smith and the School of Computing, I want to thank you for spending this hour with us. And definitely if we've intrigued you, that's your next point of contact. So thanks so much for spending time with us today. <laughs>